America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast and good morning to everyone else. My name is Jeff Singer. I'm a practicing surgeon and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. People cannot be incarcerated simply because of their race or ethnic origin, but they can be incarcerated for possessing or using a substance that is associated with their race or ethnic origin. For example, fears of white women and Chinese immigrants lying, quote, side by side in opium dens fueled the first anti-opium laws, news headlines about Negro cocaine fiends, as in quotes, made resistant to bullets by the drug, a quote, race menace in the South, uh, propelled no cocaine prohibition. Federal Bureau of Narcotics Commissioner Harry Anslinger pushed marijuana pro prohibition, targeting Mexican farm workers and African Americans and claiming, quote, it made darkies think they're as good as white men. And in a 1992 interview, former Nixon aide John Ehrlichman said of President Nixon's war on drugs, quote, by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did, close quote. America's war on drugs has metastasized to Latin America and other areas of the globe, bringing its insidious racism. In Brazil, over 75% of the people that police kill are black. Throughout Latin America, black and brown youth suffer disproportionately from the brutality of police, paramilitary forces, and drug cartels. In Mexico and Central America, victims tend to be concentrated among people of indigenous ancestry. They make up the vast majority of the more than 60,000 people who have disappeared in Mexico due to the drug war. In the Philippines, President uh, Rodrigo Duterte likens himself to Adolf Hitler as he coordinates national police with vigilante death squads in, in order to slaughter tens of thousands of people who use illegal drugs, disproportionately poor and minorities, while using the drug war as an excuse to arrest or execute his political enemies. Does the war on drugs provide a cover to exercise social control and containment of minorities and marginalized communities? Does the racism that created drug prohibition still pervade the drug war today, both at home and abroad? 
To answer these questions, I'm delighted to have with us today three distinguished experts. Deborah Small, executive director and founder of Break the Chains. Radley Balco, media fellow at the Cato Institute, opinion writer at the Washington Post and author of Rise of the Warrior Cop, the Militarization of America's Police Forces, and Ted Galen Carpenter, Senior Fellow in Defense and Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, and author of Bad Neighbor Policy, Washington's Futile War on Drugs in Latin America, among other books on the subject. I'll ask each to say some opening remarks, and then we'll have a discussion, after which we'll take questions from participants. You can enter your questions on the event page or via YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter using the hashtag Hashtag Cato Drug War with capital C for Cato, capital D for drug, and capital W for war. And be sure to visit the Cato Institute event page for links to additional materials associated with the event. And you can enter questions anytime during the event. Deborah, I must confess, I saw I was at a presentation that, that I saw you at at the Sandra Day O'Connor School of Law at Arizona State University this past February. And that's what inspired me to organize this event around this topic. So I'd like to start with you, Deborah. Please give us your thoughts uh, on this topic. Good morning. I'm really happy to be here with you and everyone else. And um, I think I want to start by pointing out that the conference we were both attending was on 50 years of the Controlled Substances Act and looking at whether or not it had done more harm than good in society. And I was arguing at the time that rather than try to find ways to tinker with a bad law, that we needed to repeal it because everything about drug prohibition and all the laws that we've enacted under that umbrella actually cause more harm to people and society than the drugs that they're designed to protect us from. Um, I want to sort of expand a little bit on the video that we just saw about the racist origins of prohibition to talk about this sort of economic component of all of this. Because as we know, and has been documented pretty thoroughly by a raft of Isabel Wilkerson and others, that racism is primarily designed to accomplish economic ends, to serve as a way to um, keep of certain groups of people from being able to fully participate politically and economically in society, and at the same time to deny them many of the rights and privileges that are enjoyed and expected by the dominant group. So while it's true that the drugs that we've made illegal were done for racist purposes, I think it's important to remember that in the context of each of those laws, there was an economic anxiety that was being experienced about the role of these workers, whether they were Chinese workers helping to build the early railroads or black workers who were now free of enslavement and working and competing with white people for wages or Mexican workers who again were uh, migrating to the U.S. and competing with poor whites who were working in the fields. In each case, um, the racialization of prohibition was designed in part to limit the ability of those people to have economic viability, to be as competitive, and to ensure that the dominant class, in this case, um, people of European descent, would continue to enjoy all of the privileges and benefits of citizenship at the expense of people of color. And so it's not a surprise, I think, that or a coincidence that we've seen during periods of acute economic anxiety, a ratcheting up of prohibitionist language, prohibitionist policies, prohibitionist positions, because that's designed in part to maintain social control, but also to reduce economic anxiety and to reinforce um, white male privilege. Um, I had the pleasure and honor many years ago to um, be a mentee of the prison abolitionist Ruthie Gilmore. And she defined racism as a series of policies and practices developed by one group of people to be imposed on another where the ultimate result is premature death. I think that everything about the way in which drug prohibition works in the United States and quite frankly, globally, actually fits that definition. 
Um, we know from survey after survey that um, the use and abuse of drugs is um, across goes across every socioeconomic group. There's no significant difference between the use and abuse of drugs by people of color um, or white people and or rich people or poor people. Every survey shows us that it pretty much is the same in every group in terms of the rates of use and offending. And yet to this day, people of African descent continue to be arrested for drug offenses at more than double their level of the population. They are four times more likely to end up incarcerated for a drug offense. Um, drug prohibition has been the single biggest driver behind mass incarceration in the United States. And we also know that more than three quarters of all the arrests for drugs that are made in this country are for simple possession. So we're not talking about going after drug cartels or kingpins or people who are making lots of money. No, we spend most of our resources going after poor people. We don't distinguish between people who have drug problems that need treatment from people who may use drugs recreationally and to have no problem. It's all considered to be a crime and treated that way. And I think the most important part about understanding the role that prohibition plays in addition to maintaining social control is that it allows um, the greater society to absolve itself for any responsibility for inequality and the various social conditions that arise from that. So once a person has been criminalized as a drug user, we no longer have to ask ourselves whether or not that person had an adequate education that would prepare them for the workforce, whether they have decent and affordable housing, whether or not they have access to health care, whether or not they even have a sufficient amount of food for every day or support for mental health issues or other traumas that they may go through. All of those things become irrelevant once a person has been labeled as a criminal because of their use of any illicit substance. And that label never goes away. Whether a person ends up behind bars or not, they are permanently stigmatized by the criminalization that attaches to um, drugs in this country. And I find it amazing that of all the crimes that you can focus on, we to focus on drug number one, particularly when you think about the fact that our economy Economy, the early colonial economy, the economy that helped establish the U.S. as a world power was actually built on producing addictive substances and selling them for profit. Whether it was sugar, tobacco, or rum, that was what built the early colonial um, economy. It's the reason why Black people were stolen and captured from um, Africa and forced to work here, was so that certain groups of people could produce these addictive products and then sell Sell them and make a market for them. So it's um, incredibly ironic and um, pernicious to me that for a country that built its wealth on promoting addiction for profit, that we now have a whole punishment system that's about punishing people for addictions. And the fact that the addictions are different than the ones that they profited from doesn't change the overall principle. And finally, I would just like to um, point out that the basic um, principles that Cato Institute was founded around, limited government, individual liberty, peace, and free markets are all undermined by drug prohibition. It represents one of the most intrusive ways um, that government interacts with people. It allows government to spy on people, to um, tap their phones, to know about their um, associations to make them guilty, whether they've been involved or not, just because they may know someone who was involved with drugs, which is why Breonna Taylor is dead today. Um, in terms of individual liberty, we have hundreds and thousands of Americans who've lost their liberty as a result of being stigmatized for drug use. And um, in terms of free markets, well, you know, by making drug prohibition, we've done the magic of turning simple plants into something that's worth more than gold. If you go throughout Latin America, you'll find that many top um, farmers will tell you that there's nothing that they can grow that's more profitable than illicit substances. So it's completely undermining all the basic principles that you all stand for. Thank you, Deborah. Ted, you have decades of scholarship on how the U.S. war on drugs has destabilized governments and punished the citizens of many countries, uh, and many of the countries that, that 
that the U.S. has recruited as allies in its drug war. So I'm um, looking forward to your remarks, which also, of course, were alluded to in the opening video. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, Deborah, I think, has done an excellent job uh, outlining the racist component to the domestic war on drugs. And while the uh, component is a bit more subtle with regard to the international phase, it is still a very real phenomenon. Uh, the United States government has shown uh, at best indifference to the fate of populations in drug source and drug transiting countries. At worst, it's shown utter contempt both for the governments of those countries and even worse for the populations, especially uh, some of the lower socioeconomic sectors of those societies. We've seen this uh, around the world, uh, but certainly the, uh, the greatest evidence of that is within our own hemisphere. We can cite examples, for example, uh, from Afghanistan, from Southeast Asia, and a number of other regions where this component of the US uh, mandated war on drugs is present, but it really becomes glaring with respect to Washington's policy in the Western Hemisphere. The characteristic arrogance of US policy was evident as far back as the Nixon administration, and it's certainly appropriate, I guess, that uh, Richard Nixon is the person who officially declared a war on drugs. One of the first victims of that war was our neighbor to the immediate South, Mexico. The administration was very unhappy about what it perceived as a lack of cooperation by the Mexican government in terms of the kind of escalation that the United States wanted in waging a war on drugs. When the Mexican government balked at some of these measures, the US used maximum leverage in a very, very crude fashion, uh, even threatening to close the border to commerce from Mexico unless the Mexican government capitulated to US policy demands. And the statements made by uh, aides to President Nixon really conveyed the level of contempt that they had for both the Mexican government and the Mexican people. They were there to be instruments of US policy, nothing more than that. What damage Washington's policy might do to that country and its people was at best a tertiary consideration if it was a consideration at all. That attitude persisted throughout the succeeding decades. It was the United States, for example, that pressed the government of Felipe Calderon in 2006 to bring the Mexican military into uh, a frontline position in waging the war on drugs. The consequences for, from that pressure were absolutely catastrophic for Mexican society and particularly for a lot of the rural populations in that country, the most poverty stricken portions of the Mexican population. What that militarization of Mexico's war on drugs did was lead to a massive spike of violence, instability throughout uh, major portions of the country and uh, brutality on the part of Mexican military forces toward peasants. Again, for the most part, indigenous populations, not the, uh, the elites in Mexico City and some of the other major cities. That problem has persisted to this day. Mexico this year is facing the prospect of setting yet a new record in drug-related homicides, breaking the record set just last year. We're looking at uh, homicides in the area of 35 to 36,000 people a year. That is a social tragedy for that country 
And it is only now that the United States has uh, seemingly shown some awareness, some concern about that development. A little farther south, the nations of Central America have been doubly victimized by Washington's arrogance, by its demands, by pushing the Mexican government to crack down on drug trafficking, one of the earliest effects, which we saw well over a decade ago, was to push uh, drug production, especially south of Mexico's border into the countries of Central America, particularly Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. What that did was tremendously disrupt those societies. And again, we're talking about predominantly indigenous populations. The drug cartels based in Mexico found it a lot easier, a lot less hassle to center their operations now in Central America. That has created absolute chaos in several of those societies. That in turn has led to a flow of refugees. And we've had several spikes in that flow over the last decade. What has Washington's response been to that? In other words, US policy created the chaos in those countries, created much of the suffering there. And when people flee that suffering, flee that chaos, try to come north, try to get new lives in the United States, we slam the borders shut. We do not want to see them, perhaps because officials don't want to be reminded of the kind of suffering that US policy has inflicted. But whatever the motive, the effect has been the same. We have created literally tens of thousands of people who are effectively homeless, people without a country. They're generally not welcome in Mexico, and clearly during the Trump years especially, but to a large extent during the Obama administration as well, they're not welcome in the United States either. So they are doubly victimized by US policy. Farther south into South America, the US policy has wreaked chaos there as well, going after drug crops in Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, primarily coca crops. And the attitude of Washington officialdom to the peasants who grow those crops, again, is one of viewing them as an inconvenience at best and a menace to American security and well-being at worst. Pressure on all three governments in the Andean region to crack down on coca production regardless of the economic effects on the peasantry in those three countries. Again, utter indifference to the effects of US policy, demanding more and more cooperation, economic retaliation in terms of uh, uh, reducing or severing aid, in terms of trade sanctions, in terms of uh, sanctioning individual officials if they were deemed insufficiently cooperative with US policy. There's been some rebellion against that policy. The rise of Evo Morales in Bolivia was a classic example of how uh, the peasantry in that country began to really resist US policy and resent officials who cooperated with that policy and the destructive effects that they were having on Bolivian society. Now, I'm not a big fan of Evo Morales. Again, very much a left-wing socialist with more than a few authoritarian tendencies of his own. But he was representing an entire class of people in that country who were suffering heavily because of US policy on the war on drugs. And his political success was heavily due to his resistance to US demands. Uh, his departure, shall we say, has taken place under uh, mysterious circumstances. The US has denied that it has been involved in what amounted to a coup against Morales's presidency, but 
I hate to say it, the earmarks of the CIA uh, are all over that episode. It's very, very similar to how the United States government has gotten rid of inconvenient rulers in a number of other countries over the decades. Uh, we now have a, quote, friendlier government in power in Bolivia. And that, I think, U.S. officials assume will solve some of the problems that Washington has had in, his, in its relationships with Bolivia. But the reality is that even the new government is going to find it very, very difficult to cooperate with Washington's war on drugs. The resistance is growing and sentiment throughout the hemisphere in favor at least of decriminalization, if not full legalization of drugs, is growing rapidly. The resistance to Washington's hardline war on drugs, I think, has reached a critical level. Thank you, Ted. I'm going to next go to Radley Balco. Radley is a, a journalist who has cataloged so much of the fallout from the war on drugs. So I'd like to hear what, what you have to say about what's been said so far, Radley. Sure. Thanks. And uh, thanks to Cato for um, hosting uh, this important event. Um, I, I'm kind of just going to add, I guess, a little bit to what Deborah and uh, Ted have already said. Um, you know, the, the one of my uh, uh, favorite isn't quite the right word, I think, but most, um, I think, emblematic quotes of, of how the United States uh, treats the rest of the world when it comes to uh, the drug war is uh, came during the uh, Bush administration and then something similar was said by Hillary Clinton um, during the Obama administration. And this is the time when Mexico, as Ted pointed out, was setting, um, you know, new records every year for homicides because of uh, U.S. pressure to kind of militarize and really ramp up its war on drugs. Uh, and as, that was, as it was doing this, um, uh, President Bush's ONDCP head uh, said that uh, this was a good thing, that all these uh, Mexican people who were dying in the drug war there were a sign that, that we were winning the drug war there. And Hillary Clinton then reiterated something similar several years later. And, you know, the idea that um, uh, U.S. government officials would publicly state that uh, tens of thousands of Mexicans uh, being murdered every year uh, was a good thing because it would prevent uh, Americans from getting high uh, really kind of hit uh, drives home uh, the way kind of the, uh, the lack of value that the United States puts on uh, the lives of people in other parts of the world. And, and you know, I, I can't imagine that uh, that's something that a U.S. government official would say uh, if there were a similar drug war going on in, say, uh, Norway or, or Germany uh, or the U.K. Um, you know, another country that um, uh, Ted didn't mention that I think is um, also kind of illustrative of this problem is, is uh, Indonesia. Um, in the early 2000s, Indonesia was fighting its drug war basically with, with extrajudicial executions, similar to what we're now seeing in the Philippines. And the United States continued to give Indonesia uh, foreign aid specifically to fight its drug war. Uh, and in fact, the, the country stopped the executions for a brief, for, for a brief period uh, and then resumed them in 2013, at which point the Obama administration uh, praised the Indonesian regime for its priority in fighting the uh, illicit narcotics trade. Um, and of course, now we've seen President uh, Trump um, uh, specifically praise Duterte for, for his um, executions, not just praising Duterte sort of in spite of his ugly uh, drug war where he's basically summar summarily executing people in the streets. Trump has praised Duterte specifically for that policy, um, which again is, is just really, um, uh, it's hard to kind of put words on just how uh, crazy and, and outrageous and you know, frankly, racist that is. Again, uh, if a uh, you can't imagine if uh, some despot in a um, white European country started uh, summarily executing people for, uh, you know, uh, drug possession, that uh, U.S. officials would be so quick to praise them. Um, as for uh, going back to sort of domestic issues, I'm just going to sort of talk a little bit about how uh, the drug war in the U.S. Um, and I think Deborah is is, is completely uh, she doesn't need me to tell her she's right, uh, but I, I completely agree with her that that the drug war is a means of social control. I mean, if we look back at uh, the, the some of the statistics, but the uh, sorry, the headlines uh, and um, uh, news accounts that uh, uh, Jeff had mentioned at the beginning of this, 
um, you know, it, it, the, the, the original drug prohibition was fought on very explicitly racist terms. Um, there was drumming up fear about Chinese immigrants, about um, black uh, people in the South, about jazz clubs and opium dens. Um, but then, of course, you know, during the Nixon administration, again, we've now uh, subsequent interviews with members of the Nixon administration have made it clear that this was uh, the Nixon's war on drugs was specifically about uh, scaring white people uh, about black crime. Uh, and that, that was very much part of Nixon's uh, campaign strategy. Um, my, in my book, I get into the history of the no-knock raid, which I think is kind of a, a fascinating history. Um, you know, before 1968 or before, I guess, the late 60s, no-knock raids happen, but they happen sort of organically. Like police would show up at a, a residence and maybe they'd hear somebody screaming inside or they would hear, um, uh, you know, somebody or see somebody, you know, loading a gun to the window. And so they would break in without knocking. The idea of a preemptive no-knock raid, this idea of getting a warrant, uh, you know, violated several centuries of common law of this idea that the home should be a place of, of, of uh, peace and sanctuary. Um, the idea of a formal no-knock raid uh, started in New York in the late 60s with some of the Rockefeller laws, but then became a national issue in 68 with Nixon's campaign. And it wasn't an idea that police chiefs were clamoring for, that sheriffs were saying they needed to do their jobs. Um, this was an idea that came to Nixon from a 28-year-old Senate staffer named Don Santorelli as a, as a kind of a um, uh, wedge issue that Trump could use, again, to sort of appeal to white middle-class voters. And uh, today, Cinderella says this is one of the worst mistakes of his career, and he has a lot of regret and, and, and shame over it. Um, but one interesting thing that happened is, so Nixon sort of envisioned the no-knock raid as something that, you know, police would basically do to black uh, heroin dealers and heroin users. We would show how tough we were by kicking down their doors in the middle of the night and scaring the hell out of them and terrorizing them. Uh, and he tried to impose the law in D.C. because, of course, the federal government has jurisdiction over the District of Columbia. And D.C. had a police chief there who refused to implement it. Um, and so Nixon couldn't sort of use this law as, a, as a, use D.C. as this kind of poster case for the glory of, of the no-knock raid. He couldn't show, you know, white cops sort of violently kicking down the doors of black D.C. residents. So instead, they passed a federal law and federal drug agents started using the no-knock raid across the country. They started kicking down doors. Uh, and we got a, a flurry of stories of, of, of people being terrorized, um, of people, uh, innocent people being killed, of police getting the wrong house, the wrong door. And one of the stories that really kind of caught the attention of the country was a, a wrong, day, wrong door raid on a, a white family in Collinsville, Illinois. And this led to congressional hearings. And, uh, you know, pe basically white people who had been victimized by this tactic testified and Congress repealed the federal no-knock raid law uh, just a few years after they had passed it. Um, you know, when they passed it, they had envisioned one set of people uh, being on the receiving end of these tactics. In reality, uh, the, the, the kind of poster case uh, was a very different set of people, uh, and this moved Congress to actually repeal the law. And I think it's a telling of anecdote. Um, we can look at some statistics about the way the drug, drug war is fought today. Um, study after study after study, and I've listed a bunch of them at the Washington Post, has shown um, that in pretty much every part of the country you can imagine where a study's been done on traffic stops, what we found is that black people are more likely to be stopped, uh, more likely to be pretextually stopped, um, so a stop that uh, is not based on an actual traffic offense, more likely to be uh, searched, even though study after study after study has also shown that white people are more likely to be carrying uh, illegal weapons or drugs. So um, black people are more likely to be searched, um, even though white people are, are more likely to have, uh, the fruit searches of white people are more likely to be fruitful. Uh, and this has been shown over and over and over again. Um, there was a study of over 100 million traffic stops in 2019 that uh, not only confirmed this yet again, that white people are more like, or excuse me, black people are more likely to search be searched uh, after stops, even though uh, white people are more likely to be carrying contraband. It also found that the discrepancy between black and white stops actually um, diminished uh, during the night. Uh, as it got darker uh, and it becomes more difficult to see who's driving the car, the police were less likely uh, to uh, be biased or, or less the, 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 the disparity between the, pol the stops of black and white drivers uh, diminished, which I think is pretty telling. Um, you know, traffic stops have become sort of one of the primary ways of enforcing the drug law. The drug uh, laws. Um, I can tell you that um, you know, after the George Floyd protest, I gave a lot of interviews where I talked about uh, the idea of getting 
police out of traffic enforcement. There's no reason really why uh, you need sort of an armed person to come to the, your window uh, on the side of the road in order to, you know, be fined or disciplined for speeding or running a red light or stop sign. And the, the, the overwhelming pushback that I got from that from police groups and law, law and order types was that, um, if, you know, if we don't have traffic stops, how are you going to enforce the drug laws? Um, now, I would consider that more of a, um, a, bu a feature than a bug, uh, but it does tell you just how much the drug war is intertwined uh, with traffic stops. Um, <clears throat> we can also look at police militarization and the effects of police militarization. Um, those two are, are disproportionately um, borne by uh, black communities. Um, the uh, uh, ACLU did a study a while back that found that um, the vast majority of SWAT raids uh, well, first of all, study after study has shown that the vast majority of SWAT raids are used to, to serve warrants on people still sus merely suspected of drug crimes, not even people who've been charged yet, much less convicted. Of course, these are extraordinarily violent raids. Um, they, they're, they're, they terrorize people. Um, a lot of, you know, they're, they're very, it's very easy for things to go wrong. There's a very thin margin for error. And what we've seen is despite similar rates of drug use, um, SWAT tactics, uh, dynamic entries for door busting raids are overwhelmingly used. Uh, against black people and in black communities um, than they are in white communities. Uh, and again, um, you know, that's not because there's more violence in these communities because these types of, of raids are, are overwhelmingly used to, uh, to serve search warrants on people who are still merely suspected of nonviolent crimes. Um, I see my time is up, so I'll, I'll go ahead and in there and I look forward to uh, questions. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Radley. Uh, first, I just want to say uh, somebody already asked, uh, Will this be recorded because that person got here late? Yes, this event will be recorded and uh, hopefully by the end of the day will be available on our website and could be shared on social media. Um, before we go on to questions, because questions are starting to pile up, I want to ask uh, Deborah anything you want to say uh, about anything that's been said so far or add or subtract? <laughs> I mean, I just want to heartily agree with the comments made by both Ted and Radley and, and just point out, you know, the fact that you cannot talk about our immigration problems and immigration problems of drug prohibition and the role that it plays in um, generating um, people having to flee their countries. I find it interesting that we're now learning that our government in its most recent push against immigration actually decided that it was worthwhile to separate children from their parents, even breastfeeding babies in order to deter um, immigration. It seems to me, given all the evidence that if we really wanted to deter um, illegal immigration, that we would do something about the economies in those countries that have been completely distorted as a result of drug prohibition. I remember traveling to Colombia about seven or eight years ago and realizing how futile our efforts were there. I went to the parts of the country where we've been spraying coca crops as part of the eradication effort. Well, not only do those um, sprays eradicate coca, but they kill everything else that's in the vicinity. And what was interesting to me was to find out that as things were going coming back, the crop that came back the soonest was coca. Okay. Secondly, the roads are so bad that if you're a farmer growing fruits and vegetables, you have a very difficult time bringing your crops to market. If you're a coca farmer, the cartels come to you and pick up the coca leaves so that they can process them. So everything about what we've done with the war on drugs is counterproductive. And the final thing I want to say is that I really can't understand why people who believe in free markets and the basic principles of supply and demand think that somehow you can address the problem of illicit drugs by only focusing on supply and not focusing on demand. Throughout the more than 70 years of Nixon's drug war, our budget has always put two thirds of its money towards drug law enforcement or supply um, reduction, as opposed to addressing the incredibly high demand we have in this country for these products. There are people waiting for weeks and months to get access to drug treatment. No one ever has to wait to get access to a jail cell. Uh, Ted, anything uh, you want to add? Uh, or uh, 
Yeah, Deborah's point you want about uh, yeah, Deborah's point about the uh, additional crops being destroyed in Colombia because of the aerial spraying program. Very important point. That was devastating to the entire agricultural sector of Colombia when that spraying program was at its height. And again, the total insensitivity of U.S. officials to the effect of, of Washington's policies on, total, on innocent people. And yet officials just plowed ahead with that policy as though the suffering did not matter. Uh, Washington's relationship with Duterte in the Philippines, I think has to be one of the most disgraceful features of US foreign policy generally anywhere in the world. That man is an utter thug Due process is a concept that he doesn't even seem to understand. Not only are true drug traffickers executed by his forces, but thousands of innocent people, thousands of people whose main crime appears to be being opponents of Rodrigo Duterte are being executed in the streets. That is something that the government in Washington has aided and abetted. Overall, the fundamental folly of prohibition policy, domestically or internationally, is that it does defy the basic laws of economics. Where there is significant demand, suppliers will arise. And the government can only determine one thing, whether that demand will be met by legitimate law-abiding businesses or whether that supply will be provided by armed violent criminal gangs prohibition guarantees that it will be the latter and yet that's the policy that the u.s government has been pushing not only on its own people but on the governments and populations of countries around the world. And US officials have done that for decades, creating an international as well as a domestic tragedy. Uh, I'm gonna be going to questions in a minute, but I wanna ask Radley if there's anything you wanna say uh, about yeah. what the others have said. Yeah, just two very quick points. One, um, I would also look, I mean, if you look at Afghanistan, for example, throughout the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, the Atlantic and a lot of other um, uh, outlets had uh, investigative uh, articles about how uh, we were basically sacrificing uh, the war on terror for the war on drugs, about how, uh, you know, uh, suspected uh, terrorists who, who were DEA um, uh informants who were sort of showing VA agents working in Afghanistan where opium fields were, were being uh, sort of left alone. Uh, we also, you know, burned opium fields and destroyed farmers' livelihoods right in front of them, which is not real all that effective when it comes to, you know, winning hearts and minds. Um, the other thing I would just want to point out is Deborah, you know, sort of mentioned about sort of the principles of the Cato Institute, which are, you know, principles that I also uh, uh, abide by. But I, I do think that you know, it's important that Cato is hosting this event because I think there's been a reluctance among the libertarians to address um, the, the racism part of, of the drug war and the criminal justice system in general. And, you know, I think there's a, I think there, it is entirely consistent with libertarian principles uh, to address and call out uh, this racism because, you know, I think libertarians are, are hesitant to support things like hate crimes laws and uh, laws against hate speech, um, which I, I, you know, also should I don't think those sh things should be illegal, uh, because of this idea that you know that empowers the government to sort of police what we think and what opinions we have. But when it's the government itself that's being racist, when the government itself is, impo is imposing policies that disproportionately affect one part of our population because they belong to the wrong group, um, you know, the thing to remember about a lot of these policies, whether it's stop and frisk, whether it's um, uh, pulling, searching people, pulling people over and searching them, uh, is that, you know, a, a healthy uh, a percentage of those people um, who are subject to those police actions are actually innocent. Uh, when, and when it comes to stop and frisk, for example, I think it's like 95, 98% of the people that are stopped and frisked are, you know, that there's no arrest, there's no evidence of crime. Uh, similarly high numbers of people who, who are searched when they're pulled over. Um, 
so what's happening then is, is government is subjecting those people to sort of a, a lower bill of rights, a lesser bill of rights, simply because they look like people that police officers think commit these types of crimes, or they live in neighborhoods where these types of crimes are more common. So they're being punished collectively. It's a collective punishment based on the group that you're a part of. Uh, and I think as libertarians, not only uh, is that sort of inconsistent with, with the, the ideals and the principles that we claim to believe in, uh, we have an obligation to speak up and, and call that out when it's happening. Okay, thank you. I'm going to start taking some questions. I want to remind our viewers that if you have any questions, you could enter them on our event page or you could enter them on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter and use the hashtag Cato Drug War with capital C, capital D, and capital W. Um, and I, I'm uh, one question I, that caught my attention, uh, particularly as a physician uh, and who has been involved in this issue. So I'm going to do a little bit of moderator's privilege and answer it, but then I'm going to uh, ask others. This person says, if the drug war is social control and racism, then why the attack on pain physicians that is so prevalent currently? Is it to increase, because it's easy to increase convictions? Now, uh, this is an area, the, the whole war on opioid prescribing uh, that I've been working on. So I'll, I'll give my answer, but then I'm, I'm going to uh, probably direct this, I think, to, uh, to Deborah afterwards for her comments. I think that it's important to understand that even though the uh, our drug laws were born of racism, that doesn't necessarily mean that every person engaging in enforcing these laws is racist. It's, it's just kind of built into the infrastructure and system of the laws that they disproportionately affect uh, different minorities. So when, it, and I think a lot of what's going on with the war on opioid prescribing is primarily related to the mythology that was created about these drugs to scare people about these drugs uh, so that uh, there's this um, completely non-scientific uh, now uh, focus on prescribing pain medicine for patients in pain uh, based upon this false narrative that that's what's causing the rise in overdose deaths uh, when in fact it's using dangerous drugs in the black market. Now, um, it would be interesting though, and uh, uh, I don't know any, any data on this, maybe Deborah does, um, if we're seeing, again, the war on pain patients, uh, which is a corollary to the war on drugs, disproportionately affect minorities. So I'm gonna ask uh, Deborah if you have anything to say about that question. So a couple of observations I want to make. First of all, um, racism is a proxy for power. It actually um, creates the illusion that race is a legitimate marker to indicate who has power and who doesn't. But it actually is just an illusion because power in this country has always been held by a small group of economic elites. And the whole purpose of racism was to prevent people who didn't have power, who came from very diverse backgrounds, from coming together to confront those people who think a more equitable level of economic um, distribution and um, political power in society. But that being said, I think um, it's important to recognize that one of the consequences of prohibition is that it allows those people who believe they have power, either because of their socioeconomic status or racial identification, to ignore the existence of problems in their own communities that they associate with other communities. So for decades, white communities have been in denial about the amount of drug use that has existed in their communities because they believe that this is a problem that primarily affects poor people and people of color. And yet to reach a point where we are right now, where the life expectancy of certain groups of white people is declining, okay, as a result of what they call diseases of despair, that doesn't happen overnight. That takes decades. Adulterants in the black market, like fentanyl, that have been directly responsible for the mass massive increase in opioid deaths because people who are buying their drugs on the black market don't know for sure what they're buying. Fentanyl is um, much more potent than street heroin. And when it's um, 
added to the drugs that people buy, the li likelihood of death is increased dramatically. Instead of addressing this as a public health issue as it is, we've chosen to apply the same criminal justice standards to addressing this problem as we do to other problems. Um, there's been a lot of rhetoric about this being a kinder and gentler drug war, but in reality for poor white people whose communities were deliberately flooded with opiates, as a way of masking the economic decline. We're talking about a workforce of people who've been used to using drugs as a way to enable them to um, work longer, whether it's stimulants or painkillers for people who are doing service jobs that require them to be on their feet for long periods of time, for people who are working in factories under conditions that are not um, attentive to worker safety. There's been a long reliance on drugs to enable people to um, survive those circumstances. The introduction of pharmaceutical um, fentanyl and um, methamphetamine into those communities that's being shipped in by cartels from other countries has dramatically increased the danger of that and the willingness of big pharma to deliberately market and promote the use of opiates to people who were vulnerable without giving them information about the potential vulnerabilities or addictiveness and to do that primarily for profit is a scandal that we should be talking about a lot more than we are right now and that quite frankly frankly, isn't going to be addressed by anything other than both um, addressing the profit motive of these countries and also the um, public health needs of the communities that have been targeted. You said you wanted to also chime in on this. Yeah, so um, uh, first, um, you know, simply because there's one sort of arm or aspect of the drug war that disproportionately targets um, you know, white people or, or majority uh, people in this country, you know, doesn't sort of undo uh, the history or the, the policy, the, the overwhelming policies that uh, disproportionately affect minority communities. And, um, but I'd also say, I'm, I, I'm gonna, I don't know if disagree is the right word, but, um, you know, I, 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 I have a little bit of, of disagreement with, with Deborah on this in that, you know, I think that, there is a problem with the way that uh, these drugs are flooded into low-income white communities. There's also a severe problem with the under-treatment of pain uh, in this country. And there's actually, a, 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 I'm sure Deborah knows, there's a racial component to this also, which is that uh, black people in particular have long been undertreated for pain uh, in the medical community has long underestimated uh, the pain that black people uh, endure and feel. Uh, and there's a, this this kind of racist notion uh, that's pervaded for a long time that black people are, are more tolerant to pain or can take more pain. Um, and so I do think that there's there are two problems going on simultaneously. One is that the DEA uh, in the 2000s started targeting uh, doctors that the DEA thought was over prescribing uh, certain uh, types of opioids, op opioids. Um, but that also scared a lot of, of, of legitimate sort of conscientious doctors out of the field of pain management and pain treatment. And what it left was this gap, gaping hole. You had people who were in pain, uh, who needed help and needed legitimate treatment. Uh, but all that was there were, you know, less scrupulous uh, people who were willing to kind of write prescriptions, um, you know, and, and hand them out like, like parade candy. Um, and it, it, you know, I think that, that it was, it wasn't, I, I don't think it was so much um, neglect uh, on, on the part of, uh, the drug war or drug enforcement in this case, as it was uh, kind of mistargeting, misdirection, mismanagement. Um, but again, you know, it, I think it does show a, um, a lack of uh, sort of care or concern for the people that they were supposed to be protecting, which in this case, uh, you know, it was probably more low income white people than it was the black community. Uh, Julian asks, uh, do you think that Mexico or Colombia would be able to unilaterally legalize drugs. What would happen if that happens with the U.S. on the demand side? And I guess I'm going to direct that one to Ted. Yeah, there certainly is a movement in Mexico now to uh, legalize drugs, basically adopt the model uh, first implemented in Portugal in the very early years of, of the century. And I think this reflects a growing realization among the political elites in Mexico that the war on drugs is doomed to failure 
and that uh, it has caused enormous destructive disruptions within the society. Uh, until a few years ago, Washington's resistance to any notion of decriminalization or legalization in drug source or drug transiting countries, that resistance would have been ferocious. Gradually, during the final years of the Obama administration and during the Trump years, there's at least a somewhat more relaxed attitude about it. Uh, the U.S. will not be happy if Mexico or any other country proceeds to uh, adopt a system of drug legalization to abandon prohibition. But it appears that Washington, at this point at least, is not committed to using the kind of brass knuckles tactics that it's used in the past. Now, we'll see where that leads, whether uh, Mexico will proceed to full legalization or not. But to me, it's at least a modestly encouraging development. And I'd like to see that spread elsewhere in the hemisphere. I would certainly like to see an administration in Washington that would be fully tolerant of that approach. Uh, I'm not sure, regardless of which candidate wins the upcoming election for president, that we're going to have that kind of administration. Uh, but at least we're not apparently on the brink of returning to the bad old days of uh, administrations, let's say, under George W. Bush or Clinton or Reagan, where the policies were extremely intolerant and hardline. Uh, a questioner uh, on our uh, event page asked, has Portugal's approach been adopted by other countries? For those who don't know about this, Portugal in 2001 decriminalized possession of all drugs and they put all their emphasis on harm reduction and they treated it as a public health issue. And as a result, they've gone to having the lowest uh, overdose rate in the, um, among the EU countries and uh, actually have had a decrease in uh and, and drug use among teens. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, Norway's parliament actually voted to order its executive to, st to come up with a plan to do the same. And I think Malaysia also. Uh, Ted, are you aware of any other countries that are looking at decriminalizing drugs? We had movements in that direction in a number of countries, including Uruguay, where there uh, certainly has been an effort to uh, adopt a uh, an approach of decriminalization, at least. And I think this is, again, a, a strategy that is slowly spreading. Portugal's program has been such an undeniable success that it unsurprisingly has led to some imitators. And if Washington's resistance to that approach continues to decrease, I think we're going to see more and more of uh, that uh, strategy become apparent in various parts of the world. Thank you. Deborah, you, you uh, want to mention about uh, Oregon's initiative, I think, right? Yeah, that's this coming election. Yes, Oregon has an initiative on its ballot for this November that would decriminalize possession of all drugs it's um, following the Portugal model. And I think it's important to note that what made Portugal's model successful is not just that they decriminalized possession, but that that represented an opportunity for them to shift their resources away from law enforcement towards health. And it's been that um, emphasis on taking a public health approach to drug use and drug abuse that's enabled them to give treatment to all of those who need it, to stop stigmatizing and criminalizing people and actually use their resources in a way that produces public value. And so I see um, decriminalization as being a step towards ending prohibition, but it's not the final step because these drugs are still illegal. People who sell them are still considered to be breaking the law, but it definitely represents a step towards taking a public health approach to drugs as opposed to a law enforcement one. Right. I'm also aware that there's a group in Idaho trying to 
uh, also get on their ballot uh, an initiative to decriminalize drugs. So uh, you got a, a red state and a blue state. This is uh, sort of a nonpartisan kind of effort here. Uh, Radley, you also wanted to comment about this. Yeah, well, this is kind of a, a comment and a question toward uh, for Ted, which is that, um, you know, bringing up Portugal, um, you, you look at um, uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, you look at uh, Switzerland, uh, all which have, you know, considerably more uh, liberal um, drug policies than we do, uh, even, you know, someplace like Vancouver. I mean, when when countries, when other countries have tried to liberalize their, their laws, as, as Ted said, you know, we, we um, in Latin America, uh, in Africa and Asia, we've kind of put the whip uh, to them and, and uh, you know, threatened to withhold aid and other sanctions. I mean, Ted, have you, have you noticed over the years, is there a, a disparity in the way the United States um, treats, um, say, European countries, uh, countries that look more like us, um, when they try to liberalize their drug laws versus um, do we take a more paternalistic attitude toward what you might call the developing world, I guess? Yeah, there's definitely that difference, and you especially see that see that in Latin America, where that has been the region of uh, the most hardline U.S. policies in response to any efforts at liberalization. Again, that has eased somewhat in recent years, but uh, I suppose the logic of that is that uh, those are the primary sources of drugs for the American market. Elsewhere in the world, uh, that is less of a factor, although obviously with fentanyl coming in, uh, much of that is coming in from East Asia, specifically China. So uh, US attitudes, I think, are turning, if anything, a bit more hardline toward that part of the world, even as it eases up a bit with regard to Latin America and some other regions. Uh, a Andrew Laurie on Facebook asks an interesting question. Um, he says, but don't traffic stops prevent the continuation of dangerous driving by people being stopped? Uh, let me do that first. Let me first pose that to Deborah, but I'm sure Radley's gonna wanna say something also. So go ahead, Deborah, take that one. Well, I guess I would just want to go back to what Radley said about these being protectual stops. You know, it's one thing for the police to stop someone who's driving erratically or is obviously under the influence, whether it's of drugs or alcohol. But what study after study has shown us is whether you're talking about traffic stops or stop and frisk, these are forms of racial profiling. People are being stopped, not because of what they're doing, but because of what they look like. And I um, published a report of 15 years ago now about a marijuana arrest in New York City, a place that had actually decriminalized marijuana possession um, almost 15 years before that. And what we saw was that under the theory of broken windows policing, of being aggressive, of going after small crimes, the police had been um, instructed to stop and frisk large numbers of primarily youth of color Eight, more than 90% of the people stopped were black or Latino under the age of 25 in the search for um, any kind of contraband. And while New York um, had decriminalized possession of drugs, it was still illegal to have it in public view. And so what the police would do is force people to take small amounts of marijuana out of their bags or pockets and then charge them with the misdemeanor offense of having the marijuana in public view. The city at its height was arresting more than 50 thousand people a year and charging them with this misdemeanor. Many of them ended up spending long periods of time in jail because they could not make bail for the offense. And yet not one of them were actually convicted because none of those cases ever went to trial. And so for me, you know, what we're seeing around drug law enforcement, both on the roads and on the streets, is the use of this as a net to bring people into the system, to be able to put them into the criminal justice databases, not because of their rates of offending, but because of what they look like. And finally, I just want to note the fact that um, there's not enough money in black and brown communities in this country to support the multi-billion dollar drug market that we've had in this country for decades. And so what that suggests is what we know, 
that drug use pervades every community in this country. And yet drug law enforcement is almost always directed at poor people and people of color. So it's one of the cla most classic examples of racial discrimination. And I just want to assert that if we had chosen to have a war on fornication and adultery instead of on drugs, and the only people who were being arrested and prosecuted were black and brown people, nobody would believe it because no one would believe that rich people and or European people weren't engaged in fornication and adultery at the same level as everyone else. But when it comes to drugs, we feel comfortable putting the blinders on our eyes and pretending that it's these folks and not us. Bradley, you want to add to that? Yeah, the 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 the, the um, you know, if these if these people if people were being pulled over and given tickets for you know driving eighty five and a forty, uh, or if they were shown to have you know point uh, one five blood alcohol level, um, or if they were actually causing accidents, that would be one thing. But I mean, you know, these studies have also shown that black people are much more likely to be stopped uh, and not cited for any infraction at all, which is what they call investigatory stops. Um, and, and, you know, the, the statistics on searches, I think, are, you know, where you really kind of see what's actually happening, which is that black people are much more likely to be searched, uh, even though white people are much more likely uh, to be carrying contraband of some kind. Uh, that's, I think, where you see what these stops are really all about. Christopher Bear on Facebook says, as people call for a reappropriation of public dollars away from Car Car oh, wait, did Ted, did you want to say something? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to, to add that the pretext aspect of so many of these stops is absolutely crucial. Uh, unless we assume that minority drivers have an unusually severe problem with non-functioning or broken taillights, it doesn't make sense why they are stopped so often for those kinds of supposed offenses. Nobody's arguing that if a driver is uh, driving erratically or dangerously, that stops are unwarranted. Clearly they are in those cases. But the vast majority of stops uh, have transparent pretexts attached to them. And I think that's the, the evidence of racism that becomes so very apparent. Okay, I'm gonna direct this question first to Radley and then anybody else let me know if you wanna uh, chime in. As This is from Christopher A. Bear on Facebook. As people call for reappropriation of public dollars away from carceral systems, what are your thoughts on how that money might be better used to bolster, bolster community safety, particularly for historically marginalized communities? So I'll go with Radley first. Yeah, um, you know, I think it, spending more money on uh, mental health, uh, particularly on how to handle people who are having mental health crises uh, would be huge. Um, and then one thing, you know, one area that I think uh, needs to be explored a lot more and that um, I would encourage my fellow libertarians watching this to read more up on is violence intervention. Um, groups like Cure Violence are actually having uh, enormous success uh, in cities like Chicago and Baltimore in intervening uh, when violence starts to flare up in those cities. And they work through neighborhood to neighborhood. They they hire people who are from those neighborhoods who know you know the players involved, particularly when it comes to, to gang violence. Um, and there's really compelling data, particularly coming out of Chicago, showing that their violence in the neighborhoods where they operate have done a, a really uh, have been really successful at. Uh, bringing down the number of homicides and shootings in those neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, as a, uh, again, I'll say as a, as a libertarian, the idea of, um, you know, maybe there's, maybe if you're sort of a law and order type, there's something in instinctively, um, uh, I don't know, uh, you, you sort of instinctively recoil the idea of, you know, we just need sort of more peace negotiators or looking at it as some sort of sort of kumbaya kind of policy. Um, look at the data. It works. I mean, it is shown to 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 work. And, you know, if we can keep communities safe with less uh, sort of armed government agents walking around whose job is to kind of, uh, you know, harass people and stop them and search them uh, and more people sort of from those communities who are using less coercive methods uh, and the communities can be as safe or safer. Uh, I think that's an option that we ought to look at. 
Uh, Deborah, you got anything you want to add to that? Well, the only thing I would add is like how we use our public resources. I think it's interesting that um, every state in this country is willing to spend money to lock people up for minor drug offenses. After all, more than 75% of all drug arrests are for possession, which means it's for small amounts of drugs. It costs a minimum of $25,000 a year to keep a person behind bars. And yet there's not a single state in this country that's willing to spend that kind of money in public assistance to support a poor family. So I just think that we have to really think about what that says about us as a country, that we're more committed to spending our money to lock people up than we are to make sure that um, a family has decent housing, food, education, the very basics of life. And then we wonder why we have so many people who were walking around um, suffering from post-traumatic stress. Well, as a society, we've chosen to in, um, continue the conditions that lead to trauma and not spend any of the um, resources, the vast resources that we have to ameliorate that. We're much more invested in punishment than we are in promoting peace and well-being. Um, John Mello asks, uh, what should this is tough for me because I don't think there should be this office, but what should be the role of the Office of National Drug Control Policy to help the president develop official, effective national and international drug policies? And should ONDCP be reinstated at a cabinet level position as was originally mandated by the law? I have trouble <laughs> answering this one because I don't think there should be an ONDCP, but I'm uh, uh, Ted, you seem to have uh, you're nodding your head would you like to say something yeah uh, I would fully agree with you the office shouldn't exist at all along with a number of other agencies that should not exist at all starting with the Drug Enforcement Administration uh, but if we're going to develop a new policy it needs to be one that is committed at least to phasing out prohibition and certainly tolerating uh, decriminalization and the end to prohibition policies in other countries. The last thing the United States should be doing is bullying other governments, other countries into adopting the, uh, the folly that the United States has pursued for decades. So only if uh, that office is designing a policy to phase itself and its mission out of existence. Can I see any role for it at all? Okay. Um, there's uh, John White asks on Facebook, uh, don't the Philippine people actually support the executions of drug dealers and producers? Um, you know, rather, you know anything about that? Um, I I, I don't, I don't know if I've seen any polling. I don't know if I would trust any polling that I did see, but I will say, I mean, you know, when there's, when the government has said it has no, indicated it and shown it has no compunction uh, against extrajudicial execution, I don't know if I'm going to tell my the, a pollster that I oppose the government. Um, but by the same token, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure there are many points in this country's history where you could take a vote on a lot of the amendments to the Bill of Rights and it probably would have failed. Um, there are certain basic uh, human rights that need to be protected and enforced, and uh, extrajudicial executions violate, uh, you know, at least a handful of those. So, uh, whether or not there's public support for it, I don't, I don't think it particularly matters. Ted, you had something on that? Yeah, I think there is certainly uh, some knee-jerk sentiment among certain sectors of uh, the society in the Philippines. Uh, supporting this as a manifestation of law and order, as perverse as that might be in that setting. But uh, the sentiment tends to evaporate pretty quickly when victims from a particular community are targeted. Uh, the other people in that community become less and less enthusiastic. Uh, Duterte did exploit uh, public discontent about a lack of law and order, a lack of stability early on. But I think sentiment in favor of his approach 
has been eroding for some time. And again, I would echo what Radley said. You have to be very, very cautious about giving much uh, credibility to polls taken in that kind of setting, because I think there would be a lot of people who would be wary of saying, yeah, I oppose what President Duterte is doing. Uh, that could be extremely hazardous to your health. Deborah wants to say something about this. I just want to say that, you know, throughout history, we've had strong men, authoritarian type of leaders who look for groups of people to scapegoat. And the people who are scapegoated are oftentimes it's done with the um, overall approval of the population. So we can talk about Duterte in the Philippines, but all you have to do is look right here. When Donald Trump came down the escalator to make his um, announcement speech for his candidacy, he referred to Mexicans as drug dealers and rapists and use that as a justification for his harsh immigration policies, which was all about scapegoating those people for the economic anxieties and fears of many white Americans. And there are many people who agreed with that because we have a human tendency to want to have someone to blame for our anxieties and fears. And so the drug war and drug prohibition has throughout its history provided a um, very comfortable umbrella for people to have a group of people that they can scapegoat and blame for societal problems and get public acceptance for that. Radley, you also wanted to comment on a previous question, I think you said. Yeah, yeah well, Ted had mentioned about, you know, when we're talking about the what to do with the ONDCP and Ted had mentioned something about, you know, how, how do we um, uh, deprohibition de of the country. And I think that's an important question, and particularly with respect to race uh, and the drug wars disproportionate effect on, on minority and black community. Um, you know, what we're seeing in places like Colorado that uh, have legalized recreational marijuana is uh, there, with that comes a massive uh, shift of income from, um, you know, the black community, minority communities to uh, kind of white the white entrepreneurial class. And uh, part of the reason for that is that it's difficult for black uh, people to get access to capital, to get loans, to start up businesses. Part of it is also because, you know, black people who might be interested in going into that business um, probably, you know, have a record because they were in that business back when it was illegal. Uh, and so I do think we need to like think about how we transition from uh, drug prohibition to a country where at least marijuana becomes legal for recreation. We how do we, uh, you know, sort of compensate the communities that were on the receiving end of the more pernicious aspects of the drug war, uh, as we, you know, transition into a legalized, uh, a legal economy? Um, that is, I think, a really important part of uh, of, of us moving uh, toward uh, legalization outright. You know, that's an excellent segue into this next question, uh, we, uh, by anonymous on our event page. Uh, Anonymous says, libertarians often say that we need to end the war on drugs as a solution for the broad problems within our criminal justice system. Do you think this, that solution is oversimplified? And if so, what concrete policy proposals would you put forward to start dismantling racism in our criminal justice system? So why don't I start with Radley, but I think everybody probably has something to say about that. So you want my answer on how to solve racism in the criminal justice system? Um, well, is it well, also, is it oversimplified? Is it an oversimplification yeah, no, no. to say it's just a drug war? Yeah. Oh yeah, no. Of course, of course, it's more than drug war. I think the drug war has driven a lot of it. I think it has exacerbated a lot of the existing problems. But certainly, we had racism in the criminal justice system well before you know we had drug prohibition. Um, you can go back to you know the the, the black codes passed um, during um, or just after Reconstruction. You know which kind of became the uh, blueprint, I think, for a lot of the drug possession laws that we have now. Um, you know, I, I think um, decriminalization, legalization, ending the drug war, ending the sort of punitive aspects of the drug war would go a long way. Um, I think, you know, uh, eliminating a lot of the aspects of policing that, that um, create so much animosity between police and marginalized communities, things like getting police out of traffic enforcement, I think would help a lot. I mean, how many, I mean, you, you take you you have fewer pretext. You, you don't have any pretext stops that way because traffic stops aren't a part of policing anymore. Um, you don't have the the situation where where um, 
uh, stops escalate into something more violent. Uh, you don't have situations where there's police mistake, you know, innocent gestures, furtive gestures. I think that would go a, a long way. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I think the criminal justice system is in a lot of ways kind of a, a mirror of, of what we as a society, what, what priorities we have as a society, what our, our values or lack of values are. Um, and so, you know, we should we should address the stuff, these issues where we can. We should try to minimize the, the damage that it does. Um, but, you know, um, uh, I, I think it is an oversimplification to say drug legalization would cure <laughs> racism in the criminal justice system or, or would even cure most of the problems in the criminal justice system. But it does contribute a lot. And it would and it would actually uh, make things a hell of a lot better than they are now. Um, it's not a particularly satisfying answer, but I'm not sure I, I have one, to be honest. Deborah, you want to go next on that one? So I'm going to start by quoting one of my heroes, Malcolm X, who said that racism is like a Cadillac. They come out with a new model every year. So I'm not under any illusion that ending drug prohibition would eliminate racism, either in society or in the criminal justice system in general, because the criminal justice system is one of the vehicles that our society uses for maintaining its racial caste system. Um, I would urge all of the folks who are listening to us today to read Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, which I think is a brilliant um, recitation not only of our history, but both the artificiality and arbitrariness of using um, physical characteristics as the symbolizer or the proxy for caste in our society. As long as we continue to hold on to the notions um, that give us economic and political inequality, we will have systems in place that reinforce that until we're willing as a country to actually. Um, have a commitment to live up to our principles, that all people are created equal, that everyone has a right to pursue happiness, that the role of the government is to protect that and nurture that and build it up. We're going to continue to see um, racism and misogyny, you know, infest every major institution, not least of which the criminal justice system. And that requires a much broader examination of who we are as a society. I think we need a form of truth and reconciliation commission, similar to process, similar to what happened in South Africa, and a willingness to um, rebuild institutions instead of just trying to reform the ones that have proven to be irretrievably broken. Ted, certainly ending the drug war would do a lot to improve our international relationships with our neighbors and also probably have a major impact on the flow of refugees and other uh, immigrants from south of the border. So, comment. Yeah, there's no, there's no question that uh, ending the war on drugs is a necessary condition for uh, resolving a good many of these problems, including making progress toward uh, easing racism. Uh, but it's not a sufficient condition. Uh, there are other factors that play important roles as well. Uh, even in cases where the drug war is not a major consideration, uh, U.S. foreign policy has pursued a heavy-handed uh, militarization uh, and disrupted a lot of societies for reasons that were insufficient, if not downright sleazy. So, again, ending the war on drugs would improve Washington's reputation abroad, but it's only one factor among a good many others. And we have to make some changes in the overall foreign policy of the United States before we're going to see dramatic progress in that area. This would be a good first step, but it is just a first step. Uh, Nathan Co Cox on Twitter asked, some people say drugs should be illegal because of the impact they have on other people. Then why don't they think the same way about alcohol? Um, who wants to field that one first? Uh, Bradley, go ahead. Well, I, I, can, I can jump in with the kind of standard libertarian answer, I guess, which is that, you know, we saw with alcohol, um, what, what 
prohibition does, right? Uh, it, the crime escalated, uh, skyrocketed. We had massive increase in homicides. We had uh, massive public corruption that went with prohibition. Uh, we had um, uh, increase in hospitalizations from alcohol poisoning, eventually increase in deaths from alcohol poisoning, um, you know, and, and an increase in trust uh, in our public institutions. So, you know, you don't, um, you don't eliminate uh, vices by making them illegal. You just push them underground. You, you add a, a element of unpredictability um, to them and you put a premium on, on smuggling them, which, um, you know, leads to all sorts of problems when it comes to contamination of the product to increasing the potency. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just doesn't work. Now, I will say, you know, there are people in the um, – uh, kind of public health movement who who do buy this, who do think that um, we should probably prohibit alcohol in addition to uh, a lot of other drugs. Um, I will say, though, just kind of on a related point, I think, um, you know, as libertarians, we do need to be aware of the fact that, um, you know, as in any other area of life, there are people who are, are um, going to make mistakes and are going to fall, and addiction uh, is going to be a problem, and it's probably going to be more of a problem if there are... Um, drugs more addictive drugs more readily available and i'm talking about drugs other than marijuana um and you know we'd be, be to be prepared to to deal with that um you know i don't think uh it's especially uh uh unlibertarian or or uh, un uh you know limited government uh to or or to support the idea of spending a fraction of what we now spend on drug enforcement uh and spending that on uh public health treatment of people who are addicted. I think that's a trade-off that uh, I would take in a heartbeat. I think I would hope that uh, most people would take that as well. Yeah, it's also important to realize that, for example, when alcohol prohibition was ended, which by the way also had, as we saw in the opening video, had racist uh, uh, in, in influences as well, um, that nowadays when most people uh, drink responsibly. Uh, the focus is on harm reduction. We have designated drivers. Um, <clears throat> and if we have someone who is cl close to us, who we think may have a drinking problem, uh, we offer them to get help. And even though, you know, most of us uh, frown upon people having drinking problems, there's not the stigma attached to it that there was under prohibition or there is with prohibited drugs so that, you know, most of us in society readily accept that some of us are going to develop a problem with that substance, an unhealthy psychological relationship. And uh, we'll try out of, out of a feeling of concern to get, get those people help as opposed to looking at them as, as if they're um, immoral uh, people who are criminals. So just, just the fact that, that when, uh, a substance is, or a behavior is not prohibited, even though we have to recognize that some people, that's just part of the fact of life. There are going to be people who have unhealthy relationships with, with the substance or the activity. The whole way we approach that differs once the prohibition is lifted. Um, where, uh, uh, Deborah, you want to say something? The drug war causes more harm than the drugs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it looks like we're uh, uh, about about done. This was a really great conversation. Um, so I'm going to thank everyone uh, who has been watching. And I really want to thank our spectacular guests uh, for this, uh, guest speakers for this program. Uh, for those of you who missed part of it or would like to see it later, um, this within 24 hours, this is going to be available on the Cato Institute website, cato.org. So you can view the thing in its entirety along with the video that was uh, made to go with this conference. And the video is also available. You'll also see on our event page uh, links to additional information on the topic. Um, so uh, I want to thank everyone for having uh, having attended this very important event. And uh, have a good day.